Blue. So in this video, we're going to talk about Jules Verne's novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is one of the great pieces of 19th century science fiction. Chances are that uh, most, at least most Americans, like myself, get their first introduction to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea via the 1954 Disney film version starring Kirk Douglas and James Mason. Verne's novel has many similarities, but there's some major differences as well. The biggest one being how much devote or how much time is spent on fish. I mean, this would be the easiest novel in the world to abridge if you just cut out the paragraph after paragraph after paragraph where Professor Aranax, the narrator, <clears throat> describes the fish that they saw in different places. So <clears throat> I've chosen one random example of this. Um, Keep in mind, the paragraph before this and the paragraph after this are also listing aquatic life. Um, but this is a randomly chosen paragraph from about the middle of the novel. We've already had a list after list after list like this. It says, from the daily notes of Conciel, that's his servant. I'll talk about Conciel later because I think he's really fascinating. I would also add certain fish of the genus Tetradoan, particular to those waters. Splenglarians, by the way, I don't know how to pronounce a lot of the names of these fish, so I'm just doing them the best I can. Red-backed and white-chested with three rows of longitudinal, longitudinal filaments. An electric tetradoan, seven inches long and very brightly colored. Then among specimens of other genera, ovoids that resemble a brown-black egg and have white stripes and no tail. Diodons, porcupines of the sea, armed with spikes, capable of inflating themselves until they look like a ball covered with spikes. Seahorses, common to all seas. The long-snouted pegasus, whose pectoral fins are wing-shaped, enabling it, if not to fly, at least to leap into the air. Pigeon spatulae, whose tails are covered with shelly rings. Macronanthi, bright-colored fish with jaws ten inches long. Livid caliomores, with rough shaped heads, myriads of jumping blennies, black striped with long pectoral fins, gliding along the surface at fantastic speed, delicious delifera, who can lift their fins like sails to catch favorable currents, splendid curtidae, arrayed in yellow, sky blue, silver, and gold, trichothera, whose wings are formed of filaments, bullheads with lemon-colored spots, <clears throat> Sorry. Making hissing noises. Gurnards, whose liver is supposed to be dangerous to eat. Greenlings with flaps over their eyes. And finally, bellows fish with long tubular muzzles. True flycatchers of the sea, armed with a gun undreamed of by the Chesapots or the Remingtons, who can kill an insect by hitting it with a drop of water. So, paragraph of fish. There's a ton of different kinds of fish that we saw. I think somebody, like, gave Verne's an encyclopedia of ocean life or something like this. And he was like, well, now I've got an encyclopedia of ocean life. I have to mention every single ocean creature in a novel. Because it just, it goes on and on and on and on. And it's, I'm sure in the late 19th century it might have been interesting although I, I really I say I'm sure I actually find that hard to believe I, I find it hard to believe that anybody was like oh man they saw troades or whatever kind of fucking fish it is like yeah Th so that part actually really drags I'm not I'm not a huge fan of that component of Verne's novel because it just we get it. There's a lot of fish in the ocean. But um, it's, an, it, it's an interesting novel in terms of the actual action. If you put aside the fish part, it, it's actually an interesting novel. Um, 
basically what happens is that something is attacking, this is set in the 1860s, uh, something is attacking ships at sea. And so Professor Aranax and his assistant Conceal, his, his servant Conceal, um, are recruited basically to go on this warship to try and find whatever creature it is that's attacking ships. Um, also on this on this voyage is a harpooner named Ned Land. So they go out thinking that this is some sort of giant narwhal that's been attacking ships. When they actually find it, they discover the, the, these three get sort of swept overboard. Um, and they discover that this is actually a submarine called the Nautilus, captained by one Captain Nemo, uh, who's an enigmatic figure. And basically, they go on a set of adventures on this submarine because Nemo, Nemo sort of determines that he can't let them go because they would reveal the secrets of his submarine because he's rejected the human world um, and so basically he keeps them as prisoners slash guests for about seven months and they just travel the world's oceans and see amazing underwater things um, like beautiful beds of coral like uh, Atlantis um, underwater volcanoes, etc., etc. So they see these amazing sights. They go to, they go to every ocean of the world. They go un, they go to the South Pole under the polar ice sheet. Um, so they have these amazing adventures. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on, and I'm going to pick out just a couple of things uh, that I think are really intriguing. Um, so one is Nemo sets himself up as a sort of defender of the downtrodden, which is an interesting position because most of his life he's spent, or most of his life during the course of this novel is spent underwater on the submarine with no contact with humanity. But for instance, when they're in uh, Southeast Asia in the Indian Ocean. Um, Nemo and Aranax discuss the plight of pearl divers, basically. Um, because pearl divers at this point in history still do, I don't know whether they still dive this way, but basically they they dove in the a very traditional way where they would hold a rock between their feet which would drag them down to the bottom of the ocean they basically scoop up as many oysters as they could and then swim back to the surface no protective equipment no uh, respirators no air tanks anything like this so it was an incredibly dangerous thing, and you could only do it a certain number of times in a row before it would have these deleterious physical effects. And actually, nobody lived very long doing this. Um, Aranax says, but are these fishermen at least adequately paid, I ask. Not really, Professor. At Panama, they only make a dollar a week. More often they get a penny for each oyster containing a pearl, but how many oysters contain no pearl at all? Aranax says, a penny for those poor people so their masters can get rich? How appalling. So we have this um, introduction of, of the idea of social justice as central to Nemo's worldview, at least. And then later, um, they, they're out, Nemo, Aranax, and Ned Land are out underwater in their, in their dive suit things. Um, and they see a pearl diver being attacked by a shark, and Nemo goes after the shark. And ultimately, Ned Land ends up helping kill it. Um, 
but they they take this unconscious Indian up to the surface and put him on his boat. And then later Nemo has his crew deliver a chest of gold to the village. Um, and when asked about it, particularly in the, the contrast between his apparent devotion to the downtrodden and his strident rejection of human society, Nemo explains that Indian, Monsieur le Professeur, lives in the land of the oppressed, and I belong, and to my last breath, will always belong to that land. So even though we never really figure out who Nemo is or uh, what his background is, at least in this novel, I think in the, the follow-up to this, The Mysterious Island, we learn more about him. Um, we get the sense that Nemo sees himself as a champion of justice. And in fact, we get this again uh, later on when Aranax is looking at some of the paintings on Nemo's wall in his, in his saloon. Uh, he says, Just then some etchings hanging on the wall, which I had not noticed on my first visit, drew my attention. They were portraits, portraits of great men of history whose lives had been entirely dedicated to a great human ideal. Kojusko, the hero whose dying words were Finis Polonai, Bozaris, the Leonidas of modern Greece, O'Connell, the defender of Ireland, Washington, the founder of the American Union, Manon, the Italian patriot, Lincoln, shot by a defender of slavery, and finally that martyr to the emancipation of the Negro race, John Brown, hanging on the gallows, so realistically drawn by Victor Hugo. So, Nemo's heroes seem to be people who have fought in liberatory causes, who have stood up for the downtrodden, who have rejected um, inequality and things like this. So we get that theme throughout. And it, I mean, it, there doesn't seem to be that much reason to question it, even in the, the sort of climax of the novel where Nemo attacks a ship uh, which is trying to destroy the Nautilus. Um, it's an un unidentified ship, but Nemo, se Nemo seems to know what nation it's from, or at least that it's from a nation built on the oppression of others. So we have that sort of egalitarian ethos here, but we also have... Um, <clears throat> We also have some odd moments of sort of colonialist perspective. Like uh, when Aranax, Conceal, and Ned Land go ashore in Papua New Guinea to, to hunt for meat and to gather up fruit and things like this. Aranax says there's a tacit agreement between Europeans and savages. Europeans may retaliate, but do not attack. I mean, boy howdy, if you want an imperialist myth, there's one for you. Um, this idea that, like, Europeans are not going out in the 19th century and brutally slaughtering indigenous peoples. Wowie, wow, wow, wow. I mean, that's... That's the fantasy of empire right there. But there's also some other interesting things here, um, and actually, I want to I want I want to talk about no, I'll talk about Conceal last. Um, so there's some other things here that are surprisingly modern, I think. Um, like at one point, they're they're talking about how long the formate. Uh, Aranax and Conceal are talking about how long the, fan, the formation of non-renewable resources like coal actually takes. Um, and Aranax says, however, I must add that the days of the Bible represent epochs and not an interval between sunrise, uh, sunrise to sunrise, for according to the Bible itself, the sun does not date from the first day of creation. So this is actually a really quite modern idea that in the book of Genesis, when it says the world was created in six days and on the seventh day God rested, that this doesn't represent six 24-hour periods, that this represents 
long scales of geological time. Um, and there's actually a guy whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it, I think the book is called The Face of God. Um, he's a he's an astrophysicist, and essentially he has made the argument that there is human time and there is God's time. And the way that this works in astrophysics is that as space stretches, time stretches as well. So according to this guy's calculations, from the point of origin of the universe, from the place where the Big Bang occurred, the Big Bang occurred six days ago. But because the universe has stretched, time has slowed. Um, or time, I guess, time is sped up. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about uh, astrophysics or whatever it is. But from the point of the Big Bang, he's calculated that six days of time has elapsed. Six 24-hour periods. But from the, the perspective of Earth, because of our distance from that point of origin, and the way that gravity shapes time, actually we've undergone billions of years. So this is a, a really interesting idea, that the, that the Bible is not to be taken literally, that it, it does in fact represent some sort of scientific truth. Um, it's an interesting idea. Um, another distinctly modern idea we have here is about the importance of conservation. Uh, so when they're in the South Pole, Aranax uh, sees some walruses. He says, walruses are just like seals as far as their bodies and limbs are concerned, but their lower jaws have no canine teeth or incisors, while the canine teeth in the upper jaw consist of two long tus tusks, measuring as much as 30 inches in length and 12 around at the base. These teeth are made of a very solid ivory that has no grooves, is harder than that of elephants, and does not discolor so easily. They are much sought after. Moreover, walruses are the victims of wanton hunting and killing by man, who will soon exterminate them completely since the hunters slaughter the young and the pregnant females indiscriminately, destroying more than 4,000 every year. So again, we have this, this distinctly modern conservationist impulse, this critique of hunting for ivory, which was, of course, something that uh, people in the Victorian era used extensively. Like, ivory was was, regar was highly regarded as a material for decoration, for carving, uh, as well as more sort of practical uses like um, combs and corsets, slats, and things like this. So we've got that critique here, which is is very interesting, very dis distinctly contemporary. Because um, unfortunately, the international ivory trade does continue, and uh, ivory producing animals like walruses and elephants and things like this do continue to be wantonly slaughtered for their ivory, despite international laws attempting to stop it. So, the last thing I want to talk about is the figure of Conceal, who I think is my favorite character. Basically, Conceal is just like, yeah, whatever. We'll get on this submarine if you want to. We'll jump into the ocean if you want to. But, like, basically, Conceal is just sort of there to follow Aranax around and to help him not die, basically. Um, Conceal almost never expresses his own opinion, but he's got this encyclopedic knowledge of the classification of ocean animals. So any animal that they spot, he can tell you the, the species, the genus, the subgenus, what other subgenuses there are, whatever kind of, everything about it he can tell you. Um, we, get, we get a great passage where he sort of explains this dedication to Aranax. Because Ned Land really wants to attempt to escape, Aranax is against it, um, and so Ned Land says, and what does my friend Conceal have to say about all this? 
Your friend Conceal replied, <clears throat> replied the worthy lad calmly, has nothing to say. He is absolutely unconcerned in this matter. Conceal is a bachelor just like his master and like his companion. He has no wife, he has no parents, he has no children waiting for him to return home. Uh, Conceal is in the service of Monsieur, and he thinks like Monsieur, he talks like Monsieur, and to his great regret he cannot be counted upon to decide the issue. Only two persons are facing each other here. On one hand we have Monsieur, on the other hand Ned Land. Conceal is here to listen, and he is ready to keep score. So, I don't know, I just, I find that character really, really endearing, that he is dedicated, he is selfless, but he's also, he has his encyclopedic mind. I, just, I don't know, I find, I find the character really, really, uh, I find him delightful. <laughs>